Hi guys, after our preliminary analysis of the potential barrier problem, we want to go through the calculations of finding these transmission and reflection coefficients. We're going to see a lot of equations today, in particular solving simultaneous equations, so let's get straight to work. So the objective of today is calculating transmission and reflection coefficients because it is these coefficients that tell us whether a particle manages to penetrate the potential barrier, or more specifically, what is the ratio of particles that when they enter the barrier, they exit on the other side. And we know that the reflection coefficient r is given by the magnitude of v squared divided by the magnitude of a squared and the transmission coefficient t is given by the magnitude of e squared divided by the magnitude of a squared. Now I want to tell you now that this a, b and e corresponds to the intensities of the wave involved in the problem. So you must make sure that you use the, the correct wave solutions. For the transmission coefficient, it's obvious that we are taking the intensity of this wave, the wave that exits the potential barrier, divided by the intensity of the wave that enters the potential barrier. And for the reflection coefficient, it's the intensity of the wave that gets reflected, divided by that which gets transmitted to the potential barrier. So make sure you use the correct wave solutions. I also want to point out that notice we don't have the, the ratios of K1 and K2. Why? It's because that these waves that we are using, notice that they are in the region where the potential is the same, and that is uh, v naught, or sorry, yeah, v naught is equal to zero, or the potential is equal to zero. So since the the regions are the same, or the potential and the regions are the same, the the wave number k one, which was k one divided by square root of two m e divided by h bar, is the same. So that's why they cancel out, right? That's why they cancel out. So that is what we have: uh, the ratios of uh, b, e, and a to give us R and T. And now, as always, for us to calculate R and T, we need the continuity conditions, right? Which I've labeled them over here. X is equal to zero. Psi one is equal to psi two. So does its first derivatives. And when X is equal to A, psi two is equal to psi three. So does its first derivative in terms of X. All right, we can employ the continued conditions at two points because at these two points, when x is equal to zero and x equals to a, there's the potential discontinuity. Okay, and I also want to point out to you that this psi one, psi two, and psi three corresponds to the more general solutions of the particular domain of x. What I mean by that, if you look at the previous video, psi one is equal to a linear combination of these two waves. All right, and psi two is the linear combinations of these two waves. So be sure you use the, the right waves for what you are calculating. Continuity conditions, we're using psi one and psi two and psi three. But for RIT, we are using the intensities of the corresponding waves that enter or exit the barrier. All right, so that's what we have. Okay, we apply the continuity conditions at the points when x equals to zero and when x is equals to a, and this is what we have, these four equations over here. Now noticing that we have now C and D, okay, C and D cut that um, belongs to the evanescent wave which is inside the barrier. They do come up even though they don't come up over here. So obviously what we want to do is that use these four equations, somehow eliminate C and D so that we just have equations in terms of A, B and E so that we can substitute back inside here. Now a strategy that I may want to employ or a strategy that I can suggest to you is that why not we use these two equations, write C and D in terms of E. And in doing so, when I can substitute inside these top two equations, I will have two equations written in terms of A, B, and E because now C and D is eliminated and because of that, that is what we want, all right? We have a, a proper strategy when we're dealing with these simultaneous equations. So I'll do the first one for you, which what we want to do now, step number one, is rearrange C and D in terms of E. So um, let's just take equation number three and substitute inside equation number four. I will divide uh, by K2, so I'll eliminate the K2 over here. So I have an I, K1 divided by K2 of E, capital E multiplied by E to the I, K1A. For the equation number three, I'll bring the plus D over to the other side, so it'll become a minus D. The minus D will be the same as this, and noticing that C multiplied by E, K2, uh, K2A is the same as this C multiplied by E, K2A. So what I can write now is that I will just bring this inside here. I will minus 2D, minus 2D, e to the minus k to a and our plus with an e to the e to the i k 1 a and this is equal to that over there right so now i got d and e and then just some simple rearranging i can bring this over to the other side and i will divide by a um, yeah, divide by uh, e to the minus k to a and as well as a 2. And that is what I have. See, I have a 2 over here. So once I did the rearranging, this is what I have. Yes, as you can see, I will add the arguments because now when I bring this over and I will multiply by e to the k to a, I will plus the arguments. So that is correct. And if I were to do the same for c, this is ultimately what I have over here. Okay, so now next, what I want to do is that since now I have c and d written in terms of e, I want to substitute this back into the first two equations and I'll divide out by a, which we'll see why very soon. Now, as always, I want to do the first one because it's easier for me, okay, to save up on the time. 
I will substitute C and D. Okay, so I'll substitute C and D inside the first equation and then I'll divide by A. Let's see what I get. Okay, so what A divided by A is 1 plus B divided by A is B divided by A. So I will just have to add these two together, right? Now I can see what is common is that I have the E divided by 2 and as well as the E to the IK1A. Okay, as you can see, it's the, it's the common factor between the two constants. So I would write E. Okay, I will multiply by e to the i k 1 a and I'll just leave the half over here. Okay, leave the half over here. I can factor it out, but I'll just leave it over there. And this tells me that I need to add these two together. So let's add them together and let's see what we get. Now I want to do something a bit special. I want to add the real parts first and then I'll add the imaginary part. So the real part is e to the minus k2a and 1. Okay, so let's see what we have. We got e to the minus k2a, and then the next real part for d is e to the k2a and a 1. So I'll plus with e to the k2a, okay? And then now, uh, opening up a square bracket, I would want to minus, okay? Minus the imaginary part now. So I'll put a minus ik1 divided by k2, noticing that this ik1 divided by k2 is the common factor between the two c and d. Now, I put a minus sign so that I will have to write this term first, which is e to the k2a, and then I would, since this is a plus, I need to minus e to the minus k2a. Okay, so that is, that is correct. I, I did the real part first, and then I did the imaginary part, close the square bracket. Now, the reason why I want to do this is because we can see that very nicely, we can write 1 plus b divided by a in hyperbolic trigonometry functions. Okay, hyperbolic trigonometry functions, because as we all know, half of this, okay, the, the exponential taken to a uh, same argument, and we plus them together, uh, one where the argument is positive and one where the argument is minus the, the argument, okay, I will get the hyperbolic cosine, right? Hyperbolic cosine, cosine h of k2a, k2a. And then since a minus sign over here, what I have now is i k1 divided by k2. The, the coefficient in front stays the same, but then now I got a minus sign, and we know that if it's the minus sign, we will have the hyperbolic sign, right? The hyperbolic sign, which is sine h k2a. There we go, quite nice. There we have it. So let's add up these two equations together and see what we get. So I'll get a 2, 1 plus 1, the b divided by a cancels out. So I'll equals 2, I'll have to add up these two expressions together. But why not I factor out the e divided by a multiplied by e to the i k 1 a since they are the same. So it's e divided by a multiplied by e to the i k 1 a and I'll just have to add up these two together. What I have is that the hyperbolic cosine adds up quite nicely, so it's 2k2a, recognizing that the argument is the same, and now I have to add up the two imaginary parts. So what I want to do is that I'll plus i, okay, and then I would add up the, the k1 plus divided by k2, add up with k2 divided by k1. So it's k1 divided by k2, add up with k2 divided by k1, and I will factor out the hyperbolic sign, which again, they are the same argument, so I can do that. Now, so this is immediately what I got written e in terms of a written at this thing over here now since this is uh, expression and I want to write e in terms of a as something else I will just bring this whole thing okay over on the other side okay which is what I did over here that's why e divided by a is equals to 2 multiplied by e now the argument there's a minus sign because I'm dividing and I have this expression and to the power of minus 1 okay and same thing when I put this back inside here Okay, I can find B in terms of A, which is what I did over here. So that is what we ultimately left with. B in terms of A written as an expression in terms of hyperbolic cosine and sine, and E in terms of A written as an expression in terms of hyperbolic cosine and sine. So finally, I'll use the expression of E divided by A and substitute that inside the transmission coefficient and see what I get. I will take the magnitude of this expression and then I'll square. Square that, okay? So the magnitude of um, 2 squared, the first one is 4, not a problem. The magnitude of e raised to the power of minus i is 1, as I've always said. Open the bracket. Now, I'll take the magnitude of what's inside the bracket, later raising to the power of minus 1. So for the first one, it'll be 4 hyperbolic cosine squared k2 uh, a, okay? Then I'll plus, I would have to square the imaginary part, okay? Like I said, uh, it doesn't matter if it's uh, plus or minus i, all it matters is that we need to square because we're taking the magnitude. So it's k2 squared minus k1 squared divided by k1 multiplied by k2. I'll square that and I'll take hyperbolic sine squared k2a and I'll close the bracket and make sure I raise that to the power of minus 1. 
Okay, uh, the square root is not there because they are square, so I'll just erase the square root. And since we know that hyperbolic cosine squared k two a is equal to one plus hyperbolic sine squared k two a, we ultimately have this expression over here, and we see that t is finite, and that means that the probability of a particle passing through the region x between zero to a is not zero. And this, my friends, is how you show that a particle tunnels through a potential barrier, like so. Right? Now, this is all due to the wave aspect behavior of the particle. Remember, the evanescent waves is able to penetrate the potential barrier. And what we say is that quantum mechanical objects are able to penetrate classically impenetrable barriers. Okay? Which is what a classical particle cannot do. Classical mechanics of particle cannot penetrate that. But it's due to the wave-like nature of the particle. That's why it's able to penetrate the barrier. And I want to say that this has a lot of applications in perhaps all of physics, such as maybe uh, nuclear physics or maybe particle physics, and even semiconductor devices, you know, stuff like charge transport inside, inside a device, okay? All use this tunneling concept because why? Because all those areas of physics are dealing in the microscopic scale.